All right. So, what questions could we ask with this sort of approach? Yeah. Okay. What else? Are some of the other questions good? Okay. <coughs> hey, what else? happening. So example areas where there's murky water, things that used to be skills to say, oh you're not my species. No, yeah, you look good enough. And so the species merging. No. Yeah. <coughs> Alright. Good. Let's do um, this one. Okay. I think it's the sort of, sort of question that we could best answer in you know the last, the last 20 minutes. Okay, um, these are all like excellent, and you know a lot of them would, would make actually really great papers with the stuff that we don't know, and so it'd be good things to study. So. All right, so now now we're going to create a model to understand this. All right, so how do we create a model? Uh, okay, yes. So, by this sort of model, I mean sort of stochastic models. Yeah, so not like a model that you learn, like models of biology, where you know, y is proportional to ax plus b. The stuff where, you know, because evolution is this random process, right? It has biases towards getting more adaptive, adaptive, and things like that. So, I do sort of, also with this, we'll do, I think, an individual based model. We have, you know, individual organisms, either species or individuals in the species, and have them evolve. What could affect their probability of going extinct? Or dying off? So, some, someone else. So, we're trying to get with this model, trying to understand niche partitioning, right? <coughs> so, what does it mean to partition a niche? These are different resources. We're going to have um, okay. And so for this kind of model, there's two easy ways to think of how you could model that, right? You could do it as you know resource A, resource B, or you could do it as a continuous resource. Okay. What do you want? 
continuous. Fine. <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right. <coughs> now what? So now we have our, our niche space with some sort of continuous distribution. Normal. Right. Um, do the problems with this? Is it normal? Yes. What? Right. So we think about our, you know, when when we think distribution might evolve, or might evolve if there's something like that, right? And so this graph in the middle, you know, Bob goes, Bob's kids go this way, my kids go this way. Which get we would better down to the food in most places for areas. Right? So, we, so we should keep this in mind. And one question could be, do you only get niche partitioning if you have you know two peaks or can you get it if you have a single peak? Okay. Good. Um, what else? So we have some individuals, they're all alive to start with. Some are gonna die, they won't have kids. But what, how does that connect to our niche model? Mm -hmm. So this one, maybe let's let's do let's just do a single population of. And then the next question you have is: Are they sexual or asexual? Right, and sexual is more realistic because then you can have, you know, this individual and this individual mate have some offspring in the middle. Okay. For this first case, let's just do asexual. Okay. Um, where you, so, <coughs> what's reproduction going to be like then? What is reproduction like in the asexual population? So I have an individual here. What's its daughter cell like? The same? So, you know, we have you know inheritance, but with, with variability, right? With mutation. <coughs> so let's have it be the same with the distribution. Okay. So it's centered on the parents' distribution with some variance. Okay. Twenty minutes to go. All right. <coughs> now what? So we have it. Have, so should we have it? Preferably have its offspring go closer to a peak. Okay, good, but here's where it's worth separating selection and mutation. Okay, so if we have it so that the offspring can be you know, over here, like that, well then we're having sort of biased mutation towards an optimal trait, which we know would be awesome for many things, it doesn't happen. Okay. Instead, we're centered on that. And it might be that those that are over here do better. Right? So we'll have to add that to them. Right? So we have um, asexual offspring centered on parent distribution with variance. So we have to have this perimeter with variance, right? And we're going to have to have selection in some way. How do we get selection here? OK, good. Is there another way to do it? So you could do it as those that are more adapted have more offspring, or they die less, or a combination of the two. Okay. In this case, we'll do it since so someone said survival first, we'll do survival. Okay. <coughs> survival. Okay. Okay. So fitness. What's fitness in this model? 
Right, so sorry, yes. So if this is the number of offspring, yep. Um, what determines your individual, like whether you have a fit phenotype or not a fit phenotype in this model? So you have an individual A, you have an individual B. Who's more fit? A. Why? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's that's in, in, in if this positioning is happening, right? What we want to do with our model is figure out um, how does this partition evolve. And so we don't want to force this partition, we want to see if it appears from the model itself. Uh -huh. And so what we're trying to do is say, so is this partitioning really deterministic? We could see um, <coughs> That you know, if you have two populations, you always get into partitioning. Okay, or maybe half time you have time you don't. Okay, or you know, or maybe even in this case you get into partitioning. It will tell us something about the, the predictability of this. Um, and so, if we think of this as sort of number of seeds of each of different mass, right? Like we're going to give the block of those finches, that one's finches, right? What affects the fitness of A versus B? Yep. How many seeds of that mass? And potentially how many other individuals are being in those seeds of that mass? So we have a model where, so we had a model of with no individual competition, then the, peak, the optimal is always being right on the peak, right, with enough masses. We know that's probably not realistic, right? Because we had all birds that use that one peak and have all the seeds that no one's doing anything with, right? So there's something that takes into account both the number of seeds and <coughs> the um, number of individuals that are, are optimized to eat that seed. Okay? Okay, so also individuals have phenotypes. Okay. So I think that's all we need for the model. Okay, we'll the need to talk about like starting population size and things like that. We'll, we'll get to those. All right. <coughs> so <coughs> let's start. So first, I need something to store the individuals. Okay. <coughs> so let's figure out how many I want. Say it's over fifty. Okay. And we got a vector. Okay. Um, and let's start with some sort of phenotype. How can we get the starting phenotype for individuals? So I'll be in the same place? No? Okay. What should we do? Should we pull from a uniform distribution or a normal distribution? Normal? Okay. This works. There we go. No, they're, they're starting individuals. What? Yeah. It could be log seed size, something like that. Right. So, <coughs> um, Okay, imagine we had this distribution. Uh, so, so, yeah, so imagine we had this distribution. Um, so 
something like that, right? If we plot it, I get a sort of curve. Okay. Um, if you instead plot the log distribution, it tends to look more normal. Okay, it's just a lot of these models. And so it's okay if they're negative values. I mean, so, you know, log of 0 0.1 is negative. All right, so to have my peak depth is 0.1, I get the log of it as a negative number. But if it. This is your phenotype, your beak depth. Yep, yep. By the way, for those who don't know, we're doing this in R. So. All right. So, this is good. So, you're making individuals. Now, let's make the fitness landscape. <coughs> All right, what should you do with that? Let's just, let's just start with this curve, a normal curve, okay? So, um, yeah. okay, good. So now we're going to be for a normal solution. Now what? So what's, what's going to be the process here? So we have our starting individuals, we have our fitness space, we have our seed space. What do we have to do? To have this evolve. Write a loop, right? So we'll have generation one, generation two. Um, Right, so we have some sort of function for fitness. So let's do our fitness function next. So, <coughs> um, how should we do this? It's going to be an interesting really continuous process. All right, so here I have A, it has this C, that's A, and I have B, and it has all these other individuals here. All right. So, what I want to be able to do is say <coughs> how much is around this area, how much, how much food there is, and how much is there. Right? So, <coughs> let's see. Any suggestions on this? Nope. Okay. Um, what? Yes, yeah, so we're doing this for each individual phenotype, right? Let's see. Okay, how much? How many seeds are at that point? Okay. So. And all I'm doing is getting this height probability space. Okay? So D norm. Okay. That's how many that's proportional to how many seeds are at that point. Okay. How do I figure out how many competitors are there? And so I have my indication of right. 
right? From individuals. Here's my local individual. Oh, let's go here. Right. How do you tell, you know, is it competing with this one? Is it competing with this one? For, for these seats? How should we do that? Well, we just, mm -hmm. right? But since our phenotypes are continuous, then we'll have exactly the same phenotype. So we, distribution. yeah, so we do some sort of distribution like this, right? Where each individual consumes seeds in a certain way. Okay. So now we've got, oh, we need another parameter. Okay. So to that, we can modify that later. Okay, I'm doing a for loop so you can understand it easily, but in general you don't want to do a for loop. What, are we do what am I doing here? And of course, since this includes itself, I'll just delete that. Of course, it's in its own range. All I should write is you can spell consistently. Right. <coughs> I could have just made this negative one instead up here, but not for, for clarity. All right. And now, fitness is seed. Density just to be zero. So it'll be at least one divided by competitors. So the number of seeds at points, but divided by the number of things eating it. Right? Now I'll return fitness. So I have my fitness function. So there's different ways to do this. What I wanted to learn from this though is that we had to make some choices like okay, we can we could have done it as they're pulling from a normal distribution, rather than a range, right? And so if you're really close, you can be a lot. If you're just barely touching, you don't get that much. So that'd be another way of doing it, right? And so it's possible the results we get might depend on that choice. Okay? So when you're reading about people doing simulations to study macroevolution, these sort of decisions can matter a lot. So if you're thinking about um, you know, one big area that simulations are used is for sympatric speciation. Does it happen or not? So someone does a model and says, look, it can't happen unless you have these weird combination of traits. And someone does a model and says, look, it does it in all these situations. Right? Or which, who's right? Well, they're doing different models. So it's slightly different models. And so you can see which aspects of the models don't make sense to you. Right? So if we'd had biased mutation towards the peak, 
you know it doesn't happen. You say, okay, yes, yes, we get this, we get this selection, this movement, but bias selection doesn't happen in nature. Bias mutation doesn't have to happen in nature, so that's the movement case. Okay, so just showing you the details here. Um, <coughs> right. So <coughs> now let's do our generations for. Four minutes left. I'm just looping over all these individuals. Okay. I'm going to normalize this. Goes from zero and one. Okay. <coughs> now I'm going to generate my new, my new individuals. Let's write individuals. I'm going to generate new individuals. So, uh, I'm going to mutate them. Centering on the parents. Any mutation right? Try it. Yeah, it's sort of all. I can't see that, but I can. All right. <coughs> um. So I'll finish going over this on Monday a little bit. Um, let me show you this plot. Out of time, but the basic thing I want to show you is so we will, yeah, I'll, I'll show the results on Monday. You can't plot them here. If you want to wait two minutes, you can see, but those you have to go to class for the class.
No, here we go. So you can see that they evolved over this point. Yeah, it worked. This is this is the random distribution. So you're seeing right now if we get if we get um, this partitioning with a random distribution. Right. And so if we find out that um, it always happens, then it's, it's still a random process, but it's, it's, it has a deterministic outcome. So that's the way it comes.